So you've been um, tracking uh, these spaces for a long time around our, our footprint, our corporate footprint, print, our human footprint on the planet, how we're relating to it. Um, and and a, an idea around a new social contract that the contract we've had is broken and has not been working. Um, give us a little slice on what you've been seeing even recently that's um, got your attention in this space. Well, first, let me uh, uh, just police your wording a little bit. Uh, Please. <laughs> like, just the, like the, um, the concept of a, of a footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, it invites you into some kind of calculation of how much uh, uh, ecological resource you are consuming with your lifestyle or with your corporation's supply chain and, and so forth. Uh, and this idea that you can calculate your impact, convert it into a number, and navigate your relationship with the world through that number, mm. I think is actually part of the problem. Mm. It's a very comfortable and familiar way to deal with things because navigating by the numbers is in the DNA of not only the corporation, but but modern the modern consumer, the modern a neoliberal subject, like you, you navigate according to what is going to maximize a number, uh, a financial number. So it's not that big a step to expand that number uh, to include the environment. And, and so the, the easiest way to do that is to uh, uh, calculate your carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Abracadabra, you have a way to be moral, to be ethical, to be environmental. And my, my, so I guess to answer your question, I can say what is on my mind a lot with that is what gets left out of the numbers. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I just came across a, a film. I haven't seen it yet, but my son saw it and was profoundly affected called Seaspiracy uh -huh. um, about the fishing industry. Mm. And at the same time as another friend wrote me about her uh, diving, like, uh, you know, coral reef explorations mm -hmm. and just like being blown away by the beauty there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, here we have basically an industry, the fishing industry that's killing the ocean. And it's not that environmentalists are ignoring this, but if you just talk to environmental funders or, or you know, read environmental um, uh, media, like that issue is <clears throat> tiny compared to climate change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Climate change is framed in terms of carbon. Mm -hmm. And so it fits into the same mentality of find something to measure and go to work on that. Mm -hmm. And what gets left out is the whales. What gets left out is the coral reefs. And if, yes, it's not that that climate is unrelated to these things, but one thing that I'm becoming increasingly concerned about is how the climate narrative sucks the air out of the room for other environmental issues yeah. that are actually <clears throat> more important when you look at the world through the, through the lens of, of life, of a living being to understand the planet as alive, as having a physiology, as having organs, then things get a lot more complicated than this uh, geomechanical view that uh, compares the earth kind of to like a big machine. And there's levels of this and levels of that, and you tweak those levels kind of like an engineering object. So this is just to give you an example of this, this basic mindset and how you know, it's part of our economic thinking, it's part of our scientific thinking. I mean, and, and to suggest the magnitude of the change in front of us, if we want to have a different kind of future. Charles, talk, talk us through, you've touched on a very important point. Um, and I think what you're saying is climate change has become carbon footprint in terms of the marketing message, both at an individual level and at a company corporate level, all through the, the, the different segments and groups. 
and often there is uh, some almost a generalization that if we sort out the climate issue we'll probably sort out the environment i mean we'll, we'll live earth will be fine again and I think what you're saying, and you touch on some very important points, may, it may sound obvious to many of us when we hear this, but you talk a lot about uh, cause and symptom, uh, and you can describe that momentarily. But I think one of the things you did, you do, do talk about is outside of the stuff you're not seeing, outside of fixing the carbon issue, what else is going on? A byproduct of mass consumption and mass production and some form of aggressive capitalism is that we've got used to building things. We've got used to getting things fast and cheap. Um, globalization has something to do with it. We're, we're building buildings all over the place. Uh, we want food um, as quickly as possible. We want it, um, we process food as one part of it. Pesticides, I mean, if you look at a market like India, you know, there's a, there's a farmer revolution going on in India right now because they've been forced to do certain things that goes against the, uh, the grain, pardon the pun, of... Um, of what it means to be a farmer, and that involves using much more uh, chemical in 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 the food production. Uh, we've seen that in the West already, and all sorts of deforestation and land abuse. So, can you tell us what, what sits on the other side? I've touched on the big big areas, but just break it down for us so we understand the other side, the stuff we're not seeing. Well, let me start with India. Uh, what's really going on there is um, a coordinated effort to destroy village life and the rural economy and to put it in the hands of um, multinational corporations, uh, chemical companies, seed companies, uh, you know, big agricultural companies um, that and, and to, to, you know, convert essentially the land of India into a industrial agricultural production site, mm -hmm. which is similar to what's happened in, in North America, uh, in, in most of this, this continent. And yeah, the farmers are right to protest and they really deserve our support because, and, and, and like you can, it's not that the corporations or the people in them are evil. They, are doing this work with their own high ideals that unfortunately depend on a very limited view of, of the consequences and also a prejudice about what the future of humanity is and what a good life is mm. and what our, our destiny is. Mm. So the ideology of progress has long implied that we, um, move away from the land, that we become more global, that we become more efficient, that we produce more using less labor. Right. Mm -hmm. And in that view, the lowliest profession would be the subsistence farmer. Mm -hmm. And progress would mean, yeah, my father was a farmer, but I've gone to university, you know, and my children are getting PhDs mm -hmm. and they're operating in a mechanized or information environment and not soiling their hands. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this, um, and, and they're producing much more food with less labor and we need more food, right? Because there's so many hungry people mm -hmm. and, and we need more goods because there's so many people in poverty. Mm -hmm. But after now, how long has it been since the industrial revolution, mm -hmm. which was supposed to erase poverty and want forever? Mm. It's been a couple hundred years now, mm -hmm. and we still have tremendous poverty and inequality, and it's because of the inequality. Like, there is actually no objective shortage of food in the world. There's a huge surplus, but half the world wastes enough to feed the other half. Mm -hmm. There's no shortage of uh, floor space per capita in the world mm -hmm. yet, or in North America, for example, but there's you know, half a million or a million homeless people and 10 or 20 million vacant housing units mm -hmm. coexisting. So the problem, the, the solution of more mm -hmm. upping the numbers mm -hmm. isn't actually meeting the need. Mm -hmm. and, and even those who are wealthy in conventional terms are not as wealthy as a traditional villager in India has been in certain important ways. 
the feeling like the the experience of community the experience of feeling at home in the world mm -hmm. the experience of feeling free to be generous mm -hmm. if you ever go to a, a, a traditional mm -hmm. society it's amazing how generous people are mm -hmm. right how connected they are how how uh, at ease they are with time like where are people more in a hurry of a traditional village in india where, where are you from af originally where's well, your family from families from delhi uh in, from delhi in india okay. yeah yeah so so you know maybe you've gone to some of these places like yeah. where are people in more of a hurry there or london or new york Mm. Well, those in London and New York have access to a lot of labor saving devices. Right. In India, to have a conversation, you have to walk to somebody else's house, mm -hmm. at least until recently. Mm. But in New York, you can just pick up your phone. Mm. So that saves a lot of time. But we should be in an abundance of time mm. in a modern technological society, but it's the opposite. So this failure to achieve the paradise that technology and efficiency and capitalism has promised is becoming harder and harder to deny. Mm -hmm. And it is fomenting a, uh, uh, you could even call it a spiritual crisis. Mm -hmm. Like a, a, like the question, <clears throat> what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. um, is this really me in this role? Uh, this feeling of being trapped in a system that I, that I don't really agree with anymore. And maybe all of us being trapped in it. And how do we get out? Like, these are some of the things that are boiling under the surface. You know, this is reminding me, Charles, last time you came on here, you talked a lot about this narrative that we have around disconnection, that we have this story that we're disconnected from our ecosystem, from our planet. And therefore we can have more of an extraction relationship versus a generative collaborative relationship. And I know that's really underneath so much of what we're talking about here. So here's my question to you is when I look at a lot of organizations, we are seeing a lot of trends toward being more sensitive to the, their impact, to their employees, to their environment, to their consumers. Um, there's much more um, uh, receptivity toward that than ever. So I do see some hope in some of those ways. And it also seems like there's a whole revolution that still needs to happen to really build this next level of empathy and compassion, which is one of the titles of this talk today, of how do, how do you actually generate compassion? How do you start to feel more empathy toward that if I'm destroying my backyard, I'm destroying myself? How do we, any, any tips you have on how to help people connect those dots a little more clearly? Yeah, so you've actually named two different things. One is compassion or empathy. The other is self-interest. So mm -hmm. if I destroy my backyard, I'm harming myself. If I destroy the whales, I'm harming myself. If we cut down the rainforests, mm -hmm. we're harming ourselves. That is one reason to stop doing these things, but it's not a good enough reason. It's like, like if you approach a, uh, a corporation and they're like, they're like, Rick, I'd like to become, you know, we would like to become more sustainable. Um, and, but we want to make sure that it, we're going to make even more money. And you say, yes, that's possible. If you do this, this, and this, you're going to make more money. Mm -hmm. Well, are they actually doing it because they want to be sustainable? Mm -hmm. right. Right. What are you appealing to mm -hmm. at some point? <clears throat> okay. Like there is this kind of dogma that if you are, socially and environmentally responsible as a corporation, then your profit profits are going to improve as well. Mm -hmm. And morale is going to improve. There's lots of reasons why you're going to be more innovative. Mm -hmm. You're going to anticipate future regulatory trends with your pro-social and pro-environmental behavior. Like there's all these arguments why uh, profit and social environmental responsibility is not uh, in opposition, mm -hmm. except it's not always true. And, and, probably anybody who's running a company or, or making these decisions, or even as a consumer, like you're going to have moments where the more <clears throat> ethical product is more expensive. And boy, it sure looks like your bottom line is going to suffer. And maybe it will suffer. Like, because the question is, why are you actually doing this? Mm -hmm. Is it, what do you care about? What God are you serving? Mm 
the God of money or the God of life. That would be one way to put it. And this choice point will inevitably come up as a way to clarify the driving question of a human being, or one of the driving questions, which is, why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? And so we're given these opportunities to clarify that to ourselves and to whatever social or divine witness there is. Like, what do I serve? And it's necessary for it to seem like a choice, to seem like, yeah, I have to either, you know, play it safe, minimize my risk, maximize my profit. And maybe if within that, I'll make the best ecological choice. But you're serving the profit. Mm -hmm. Or are you going to serve what you really care about? That's, that's the choice point that every human being faces in one form or another.